Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead, and that day, that Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body, they saw the angel sitting there, and they said, where is Jesus? The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. I submit to you tonight that that's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there's more proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than almost any other fact in Roman history. I don't believe there's a fact in ancient history today so well proven as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even if there was no proof, no historical proof, no scientific proof, and there is, I would still believe it because I believe this book is God's inspired word and the whole early church went up and down the country preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the thing that shook the Roman Empire, that a man had risen from the dead, that he was alive, that death could not hold him. Christ is alive. He's a living Savior. That's the message this morning. Uh, we're happy to see you guys. Happy Easter. He's risen. Um, we have every reason this morning to just celebrate and praise him. So if you want to stand up, we're going to start by worshiping him this morning. He deserves all the praise. He's risen. <laughs>
That we called sin and shame And they were like prisons That we couldn't escape But he came And he died And he rose Those walls are rumble now Remember those giants Remember those giants We called death and grave they were like mountains that stood in our way But he came, and he died, and he rose Those giants are dead now This Sunday we sing, this is our God This is our God, this is who he is He loves us This is our God, this is what he does He saves us He bore the cross Beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely pray. But he heard every word. Every whisper. Now those altars. Now those altars in the wilderness. Tell the story of his faithfulness. Never was, did he fail, and he never will. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God, this is what he does, he saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. Who pulled over all of our sins? Nobody but Jesus Who pulled me out of that pit He did, he did Who paid for all of our sins Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave Yahweh, Yahweh Who gets the glory and praise Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave Yahweh, Yahweh, who gives the glory and praise? Nobody but Him. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Let heaven and earth proclaim This is our God, King Jesus
our Savior King. The crown of thorns, God's plan, He chose the weight He wore our sin. From nail-pierced hands, flow crimson grace, He washed us clean, He took
king there's no other king like you no other king has been able to overcome the grave you came for us when we were undeserving you sacrificed yourself for us Lord we have every reason to praise you this morning and every morning doesn't matter what's going on in our lives you reign you are holy forever and ever we glorify you this morning we lift these songs for you we thank you that you're risen that you are alive and you are here working in our lives this very day we thank you that you keep your promises we thank you that you fulfilled the prophecies and you're continuing to do that and someday we get to be with you because of you coming for us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We celebrate you this morning and everything you are. We celebrate that we have a king who has risen. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.
Well, happy Resurrection Day to all of you. It is great to have you with us. Happy Easter. It is, uh, I, I want to start with just thanking the praise team. Um, they are just so phenomenal, and I am just so thankful for them. And they, it, it really, that good worship really helps to open up the study of the Word of God. It just kind of sets the stage and and lays the, the, the path for the bringing of the Word of God. You probably don't remember the name. In fact, many of you may not know the name or never heard the name. It's Nikolai Ivanovich Bukharin. He was, during his day, one of the most powerful men on earth. He was a Russian communist leader. He took part in the Bolshevik Revolution that happened in 1917. He was editor of the Soviet newspaper, which is called Pravda, which, by the way, means truth, which is an oxymoron in itself, because it seems like in media there isn't truth these days. Um, he was a full member of the political party of the day. His works on economics and political science are still read to this day. There's a story that was told about him taking a journey from Moscow out of Kiev in 1930 to address a huge assembly on the subject of atheism. He was a staunch atheist, and so he took this time to really demonstrate why atheism was right, why it was true. He addressed the crowd, really leveling a lot of ammunition against Christianity, hurling insult and argument and proof against it. About an hour after he started speaking, he was done, and he began to look out over what really was just a smoldering um, ashes of men's faith. And he said, are there any questions? Buchanan demanded that response, and it was just deafening silence across the auditorium. And then one man approached the stand. He was an elderly man. He took the stand where Buchanan had been speaking. He went up to the lectern that Buchanan had been speaking from, surveyed the crowd from left to right. Finally, he shouted the ancient greeting known well in the Russian Orthodox Church. He said these words, Christ is risen. In mass, the entire crowd arose as one man, and the response was crashing like the sound of thunder, in which the crowd responded, He is risen indeed. I want to try that with our group today. So I want you to stand today, where you're at, just stand up, and I want to make that statement, He is risen, and I would like you to respond back with, He is risen indeed. Let's try this together. He is risen. He is risen indeed. That is awesome. You may be you may be seated. There's nothing that can keep Jesus down. There's nothing that can keep the message of Jesus down. There is nothing that keep the resurrection down. Jesus will accomplish what he wants to accomplish. His message has never stopped. It continues to go on, and it continues to change life after life. It continues to set people free and restore and reconcile brokenness in people's lives. There was a children's play, and the children's play was about Easter, and the director was supervising the cast all of the kids that had different roles. There was one particular boy in, the, in this cast, in this play, that did not have any lines. You see, he was simply the stone that was in front of the tomb that was to be rolled away when Jesus would come out. The director asked the little boy, do you want to have a different part, a speaking part? Would you like to say anything? And his response to that was no. I like letting Jesus out of the tomb. It feels really, really good. That heart is what I love. That heart of somebody who says, I love the message that Jesus is no longer in the tomb, that he is free, that he has been set free, that he has conquered death, that he lives again. And because he lives again, he is what is called in the Bible the first fruits, meaning he's the first one of many that will be ri raised to new life because they have trusted in Jesus as their Savior. Today, we are going to cover just one verse from the Bible. It's found in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. So if you have a Bible with you, I would encourage you to turn there. 1 Peter chapter 1, let's pray as we begin. Father, we are grateful to be able to come before you and worship you, the risen Savior, this day. 
we proclaim that you are risen. It's what we believe. It's what we know. And it's what we hold on to. It is the hope that we hang on to that keeps us going. I pray, Lord, today that you would do something special among us, that our hearts would be touched by you. Give us ears to hear, a mind to comprehend, and a soft heart ready to receive your truth. Take my feeble words, Lord, and use them with power to speak your message and your truth. We are here today on this Resurrection Sunday to worship you. And though it's kind of crummy outside, we can rejoice here because you are in this place. You are the risen King of kings and Lord of lords, and we praise and worship you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, here are, here's the verse that we are going to look at today, and I'm going to show you from this four things about the Father that we want to highlight here this morning on this Easter Sunday. It says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I know that some of you are skeptical about the idea of a resurrection, skeptical about the idea of Jesus rising again. I really get that. But I want you to consider what Chuck Colson said one time. Now, if you don't know the name Chuck Colson, he is deceased now, but he was a part of the Watergate scandal that happened in the 1970s. That scandal really rocked the country in many ways. Some of you were not alive for that time. Maybe you've not not learn that in history, but Chuck Colson was uh, President Nixon's special counsel and also his really his henchman on the Watergate scandal itself. Now he was arrested, thrown in prison. In prison, he came to know the Lord, and he had an amazing ministry for the rest of his life because of what happened to him, the encounter that he had with God in prison. Chuck Colson said these words. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact. And Watergate proved it to me. How? He said, because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, and then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Every one of them was beaten, stoned, tortured, eventually killed. They had been put into prison. They would not have endured if it weren't true. He then went on to say, Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in Washington, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. That's how he knew it was true. People that were so committed that they would be willing to give their lives, give of their freedoms, go through torture, go through prison, all because they knew it was true. We celebrate and proclaim that truth today. We know it to be true. Now, I want to highlight for you today four things from the verse that we just read about the Father's great love toward humanity. Let's look at this together. We're going to start with these words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. That's the first thing we're going to work, look at this morning. The Father's great passion is mercy. That's his passion, and that is his desire. That's what motivates God. God's motivation is mercy. He wants to show mercy to the world. He does not want anyone to perish, doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He wants to offer mercy. That's the heart of God. That is the heart of who he is. Now, what is mercy? Well, mercy is the benevolent or compassionate treatment of someone suffering or in need. Mercy is an attitude that moves us to act on behalf of the unfortunate. On a divine level, mercy is the foundation of forgiveness expressed in God's pardon of human sin. It is the gift of God's undeserved kindness and compassion. It's important to understand mercy. Mercy and grace are two words that you may have heard in Christianity. They are two sides of the same coin. Mercy on the one side, grace on the other. Mercy means this, not getting what we deserve. Grace means getting what we don't deserve. In other words, 
Mercy is this. Every person deserves hell. Death. Every person deserves to hang on a cross. God didn't give us what we deserve. That's mercy. Grace is, I'm going to go beyond that, and I'm going to bless your socks off. I'm going to give you life. I'm going to give you hope. I'm going to give you meaning. I'm going to give you purpose. I'm going to walk with you. That's his grace. Grace and mercy. In Romans chapter 3, it says this, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, for the wages of sin is death. That is what we deserve. Because we have sinned, every one of us has, there's no one here immune from that. Because we have sinned, we deserve death. We deserve the cross. We deserve hell. We deserve eternal suffering. That's what we deserve. God in his mercy comes along and says, I don't want to do that to you. I want to show love to you. I want to show compassion. I want to make a way so that you don't have to go to the cross and you don't have to go to hell and you don't have to have eternal suffering and eternal punishment. I want to give you a way. That is the mercy of God. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 31, it says this, Nevertheless, God, in your God, great mercies, you, God, did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. So God wants to make a way, and that's what mercy is. In the book of Luke, it says of Jesus, because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. There's a story that is told in Napoleon's army that Napoleon had a soldier who committed an offense worthy of death. The punishment was handed out. This young man was going to go before a firing squad in a week. As he was preparing for this, facing this, the day before his scheduled execution, his mom came in and spoke to Napoleon and asked Napoleon, please show my son mercy. Napoleon harshly replied, woman, your son does not deserve mercy. To which she said, I know. If he deserved it, then it wouldn't be mercy. See, that's what mercy is. Mercy is an undeserved. God saying, I'm going to remove the punishment from you. You deserve punishment. I deserve punishment. And God in his mercy says, but I'm not going to give that to you. It says in the book of Lamentations, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And so that is the first part of that verse. It is the Father's passion, love. He wants to show people mercy. Whether they will receive it or not, that's an entirely different subject. But that's the Father's heart. And he wants to give that to people. The Father's great plan is the next one. What is his plan to show mercy? Well, here's the plan. We have to be born again. That's what the plan is. Go back to the verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again. That's his plan. That's the way that he has provided for us to receive that mercy. We have to be born again. Jesus describes this to a guy by the name of Nicodemus in the Gospel of John. Here's the encounter that they had. Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, and Jesus said to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water, that's the amniotic fluid, and being born of the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say to you, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. Well, that's exactly what Peter said. God wants to give you mercy by you and I being born again. What does that mean to be born again? Well, let me illustrate it this way. God uses in the Bible the synonym of heart 
to describe the spiritual condition of people. You have a physical heart. It's beating. You would not be sitting here today if your heart was not beating, pumping blood. Your heart is considered the center of life. If your heart is not going, there's a problem. In the same manner, spiritually, we need a heart transplant. We need a heart change, a spiritual heart change. The Bible describes that the heart of people who don't know God, he describes it as being dead, of being darkened, of being hardened. And so picture it this way. You've got a heart that is dark. It's dead. It's hardened. There is no life. There is no connection with God. What God wants to do is to come into your life and have you be born again through Jesus. You are born again. Your spiritual heart comes to life. There was once a Volkswagen that desperately wanted to become a Ferrari. He loved the Ferraris. He looked at the Ferrari magazines, watched Ferrari videos every time he possibly could. He desperately wanted to be a Ferrari. However, he was a Volkswagen, a Volkswagen Beetle nonetheless. Now, the Volkswagen Beetle, who had a dream to be a Ferrari, thought he would do a few things. He will, number one, change the emblem on the hood. I'm going to take this Volkswagen emblem off, and I'm going to put a Ferrari emblem on. Not stopping there, he thought, well, I need to change my paint job from the green color that I am. I need to change it to Ferrari red. And I know that if I change my paint job and I change my emblem, I'll be a Ferrari. Well, he wasn't fooling anyone. No one believed him to be a Ferrari. He thought, well, I'll do the next thing. I will cut off parts of my body and I will have new things welded on. And then I know everybody will think that I am a Ferrari. So he went through the process of doing that. The problem was that even though he was looking like, pretending to be acting like a Ferrari, under the engine, the transmission that happened was all Volkswagen. No power, no guts, just a Volkswagen engine. It was not until he finally went back to the refiner's fire, where the refiner took the entire thing and melted it down and remolded and put it into a brand new casting. And then took a brand new engine and a brand new transmission and all of the components that went with this. And then he was refashioned into a Ferrari. See, there, there's no amount of change that you and I can do that will change the problem we have. Our hearts are dead. The Bible tells us that the heart is deceitfully wicked. It's dead. It's a mess. It's hardened. It's far from God. And the only hope we have is not religious effort and trying really hard and working really hard. The only hope we have is a brand new heart, a heart transplant, that God causes us to be born again. How, how am I born again? It's when I ask for forgiveness and I invite Jesus into my heart. When I repent of my sins and I commit to following him, I ask him, please forgive me. I confess my sins to him. I need him. I invite him into my life. I repent of my life. And when that happens, I am born again. So that is the father's great passion. He wants us to have mercy. No one should perish. That's the father's great plan. I want to make you born again. I want to change your heart. That comes to the father's great promise. And the father's great promise is living hope. Again, let's look at what the verse said that we are using today. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope. Hope comes from being born again. Being born again comes from the Father's mercy. It is a continuum that happens. 
There are all kinds of people that look for hope in places that will never provide it because it doesn't come from God. It doesn't come from being born again. The word hope in the Bible is not wishful thinking. Oftentimes in our society, we use the idea of hope with a connecting word, the word, two-letter word, the word so. I hope so. Well, that's just wishful thinking. I hope so. I hope the Broncos are going through a rebuilding time and next year they're phenomenal. That's wishful thinking. In fact, it's worth just giving up on that idea. I hope so. That's not biblical. Biblical hope is confident expectation. I know it. I believe it. And it's changed my life. This is the hope the disciples had. They would face imprisonment and beatings and torture and death. And they would never relent on what they knew to be true. Why? Because they had a hope. I will be with him forever. He is God. I have that hope. I'll do whatever is what they would say. That's an amazing amount of hope. People who are righteous, who put their trust in him, find the hope that they desperately need. We have a lot of people in our society that are hopeless. So much so that they feel like, I don't even want to live anymore. It's because they don't have the hope that God provides. Psalm 28, verse 7. The Lord is my strength. He is my shield. In him my heart trusts. And I'm helped. My heart rejoices, exalts. With, a, with my song, I give him thanks. That is, that is hope. Why do I hope? Well, he's my strength. He's my shield. I can trust him. He's so good to me. I can give him thanks. Therefore, I will hope. Do you know that hope also takes away worry and anxiety and fear? In the book of Psalms, it says, Therefore, we're not going to fear, though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, its waters are roaring, it, they're foaming, the mountains are trembling and it's swelling, but we're not going to fear. I believe that we are moving further and further down the road of the end times. And with that, it's going to get tougher and more wicked. It's already incredibly wicked, but it's going to get more. The mountains are going to tremble. The waters are going to roar, but we don't have to because we have hope as the anchor for our souls. We hold on to that no matter what comes our way. My wife Jennifer and I, we were watching um, CBN News yesterday. And we were watching about the church in Ukraine. There's a, a couple of Ukrainian churches that are right across the border, right across the river from where most of the battles are taking place. In fact, their area is being shelled all the time. The churches, amazingly, have not been hit. And they're still going strong today. And one of the churches that was about 50 people before the war happened is now about 1,000 people. And it showed pictures of people bundled up in coats, sitting outside, just trying to hear because they desperately need to feel a sense of hope. And that's what God provides. He provides hope. It's why Paul writes this in Romans 15, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Well, that is the Father's great mercy, or great passion. It's his mercy. His great plan is that we're born again. His great promise is when that happens, I'm going to give you hope. So again, look at this as that progression is taking place. Mercy leading to born again. Born again leading to living hope. Well, the Father's great present that makes all of this happen is Jesus the Christ. The Christ means Messiah. It's not his name. It just means the Messiah. It's his title. He is the Messiah, the coming one, the one who fulfilled everything in the Old Testament, all of the prophecies fulfilled in Jesus. Again, Peter says, according to his great mercy, 
caused us to be born again to a living hope through, through what? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's where it all originates. And that is ultimately the Father's great present that he has presented to the world. He gives something. You know, God is amazing because he does not require you and I to clean ourselves up and to make ourselves look good, spotless, pretty. He meets us where we're at, pulls us out of the pit, and sets us free. People who think, I have to clean myself up, I have to make myself, I have to do all these deeds, that's called religion. And that's not what we're about. God is not about religion, He is about a relationship with Him. You don't have to clean yourself up. God will meet you where you're at, and then He will clean you up. No doubt about it. That is the way that His mercy flows. It is through Jesus. It is through the gift of his son. Every one of us deserve to hang on the cross. We deserve life apart from him. Hell. Jesus came as an offering, a present of God to go to the cross on our behalf so that we wouldn't have to. Amen. It says in the book of John, a verse that everybody knows, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life for God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world he, he didn't bring judgment that time he will in the future but he didn't then he didn't bring condemnation on you and I he didn't come to shame you he didn't come to say well clean yourself up and then you can be presentable he came to save you he came to save the world, that the world would be saved through him. That is the hope that we have. That is the gift that God offers. Through Jesus, his mercy is demonstrated, and he gives us the opportunity to be born again, and he gives us a living hope. And the hope is the resurrection, that because Jesus was raised and he conquered, we can follow in those footsteps and that we can have life eternal with him. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians, and God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Let me close with the words of John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me Though he die physically, he will live spiritually. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never really die. Do you believe this? And that's the question I want to pose to you today on this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday. Do you believe that? Do you believe him? Do you believe the life that he gave for you, the life that he died on the cross to save? Do you believe the resurrection? When you believe, mercy flows out of a God who has passion for people, love for people. But it's really based upon whether or not we believe. When I read in John, it's whoever believes has eternal life. When we read again in John, whoever believes in me shall never die. Do you believe? That is this Easter morning, the mercy of God. It is the plan of God. It is the promise of God. And it is the ultimate present that God offers. I'm going to close today with a word of prayer. And if you have never had a God moment where you've asked him into your life and said, please, Jesus, please forgive me. Please, I invite you in. I want to repent of what I have done, and I want to follow you. I want to encourage you to make this the moment. This is not about me. It's not like I get a commission from God if you do that. I'm not trying to sell you on anything. 
This is between you and him. A warning for your soul. A warning for all eternity. That God wants to give you his mercy. Now the ball is in your court. Will you believe? Invite him in. Follow him with all of your heart. Let's pray as we close. Father, I pray today for anyone in this room, anyone watching, that this would be the moment where they say to you, I need that mercy for myself. Lord, I'm sorry for what I have done. I confess to you that I have been a sinner. I have been a mess. I have lived my life apart from you. And Jesus, I invite you to come into my life. I ask you to come into my life and save me. Lord, I want to repent and turn away from what I was doing and how I was living. And I want to turn and follow you. Lord, please do that work in us. Lord, for anyone who prayed that, who said, yes, that's what I need, that's what I want, I pray right now, Lord, that you would confirm in their hearts that they are your children, that they now have been saved. Their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And from this moment on, everything will be different. Lord, bless, protect, and watch over this body of believers who loves you, and is following you. We thank you for being here today. We thank you for this Resurrection Sunday that we can celebrate together. Thank you, Father, that you conquered the grave. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you need any extra prayer, we're going to have people at the tables up in the front. would love to pray with you and just uh, help you any way that we possibly can. Have a wonderful Easter Sunday and looking forward to seeing you back here again. God bless you.